So now we're going to look at a medium which has got two boundaries. And in this case, we're going to concentrate on looking at a piece of string with two ends. So we've got a fixed length of string, and we're going to have closed boundaries at either end, which means the displacement of the string has going to be constrained to be zero at either end of the string. And this is going to give rise to a phenomenon that we call standing waves. So let's start, first of all, by having a look at the mathematical description of the waves and coming up with a mathematical prediction for what we expect to see. So what we've got is we've got a string now with two ends, both of which have been clamped. And we're starting with a wave that's traveling in that direction. And so we're going to have an initial uh, displacement psi of x and t that will be just our standard wave, cosine of kx. And since we're traveling in the positive x direction, it's minus omega t plus some phase constant phi. But when this reflects off the closed end, the end that's clamped here, the uh, uh, clamped end of the string, we're going to have a phase difference of pi. So we're going to have a phase change here of pi. But I can model that by just flipping the sign of the wave. So I'm going to have a minus sign here um, because I've had this phase change of pi when it reflects off the end. And now it's a negative traveling wave. So here I'm going to have a times the cosine. And then this is going to be kx plus omega t and still plus this phi, where the phase change now comes in through this minus sign. So my displacement is going to be the sum of these two waves, the wave that's traveling in the positive direction and then the wave that's traveling in the negative direction, but with a minus sign because of the phase change due to the closed end of the uh, string. So when I do this, I'm going to be using my trig identities. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to group the kx and the phi together. So I'm going to have kx plus phi minus omega t here. And I'm going to look at kx plus uh, phi here, and then plus omega t um, here. So when I do that and expand this out, well, I'm going to have a. And then this is going to be the cosine of kx plus phi. Uh, times the cosine of omega t. And then it's a subtraction, so that means I add um, a times the sine of kx plus phi, um, and then times the sine of omega t. And this is just the uh, formula, uh, the trig identity for the cosine of alpha, in this case minus beta, right? And we expand that out. So now I've got to expand out this second term, remembering it's got a minus in front. So what I'm going to have here is I'm going to have minus a times the cosine, and then it's kx plus phi as our first term, times the cosine of omega t. And then because it's an addition now, it's a subtraction when I'm using the trig identity. And so this becomes a minus, but then I've got a minus here, so that becomes a plus a times the sine, and then again kx plus phi, that's our alpha if you like, and then times the sine of omega t, which is our beta. So as you can see here, this term and this term are going to cancel out. And so my net displacement is just 2 times a, which is the amplitude of one of the waves, times the sine of kx plus phi times the sine of omega t. And so this is the uh, displacement of the uh, medium. Now, the next step is we've got to add in our boundary conditions. So here we have our displacement for our string. And here we have the boundary condition. So we've got a boundary at x equals 0. And so the condition here is that the displacement must be 0 when x is 0. And similarly, because we have a closed boundary at x equals l, there's also a condition that the displacement is 0 when x is equal to l. So let's look at the first of these, that the uh, psi must equal 0 when uh, x is equal to 0. So if I look at this, if I put x equal to 0 in here, so I'm going to put x equal to 0 in psi, then psi will equal 2a times the sine of 
phi times the sine of omega t. And I've got to have this equal to zero for any value of time t. So what that means is that the sine of phi must be zero, and the easiest way to do that is to just set phi equal to uh, zero. So we found our value for phi. So our next condition is that the uh, displacement at L must be equal to zero as well. So we can put that in now. So psi when x is equal to L is going to be 2a, and now we've got the sine, and it's just kx, so this is now just the sine of k times L, and times the sine of omega t. So again, this has to be equal to zero, and for any value of time, so the only way that we can make this uh, sure that this is equal to zero is have this term equal to zero. And so therefore, we have the sine of k times L must be equal to zero. Now to get that to be true, we must have that k times L is equal to, and now we need something like, it's gotta be zero, or it can be uh, pi, or it can be two pi, um, and so on. So it can be any, any integer number of pi. So if we expand this out, then I can rewrite k, remember, which is just the wave number, as 2 pi over lambda, multiply that by L, and that must equal some integer number of pi. And if I rearrange this, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get that the wavelength lambda must be equal to, um, and then I can cancel the pi's here, and so the wavelength lambda now must be equal to um, 2L divided by N. And so our condition for our standing wave, which we're going to get uh, when we've got these two uh, ends of the wire fixed, is that our wavelength must be only have certain fixed values. So this means that it can be equal to uh, 2L, it can be equal to L, it can be equal to uh, 2 thirds L, and so on, as N goes from 1, 2, 3, and so on upwards. So now we've got our solution, let's have a look at some of the features. So the first of these is why do we call it a standing wave? Well, if we had a function that contained a kx minus omega t, that would give us a wave that's moving uh, in the positive x direction. Similarly, if we have kx uh, plus omega t, we have a wave that's moving in the negative x direction. But here we have the x part of the uh, wave function completely separate from the time part. They're multiplied together. There's no additional subtraction, and so that means that we've got no motion, either to the left or to the right, and so we have have a wave that is standing still, and so we call it a standing wave. Now, the other thing to notice is because we're multiplying these two, uh, you know, the time dependence here is multiplying by the x dependence, then the entire wave at certain times will be completely flat. There'll be zero displacement when this term here is equal to zero. We'll end up with a completely flat piece of string. So the amplitude is going to be dependent on where we are because the amplitude is this sine function here and that depends on x, but we're only allowed certain wavelengths because n here can only be equal to one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So let's have a look and see what that looks like when we uh, vibrate a string with one of these standing waves. So here we've looked at the case where n is equal to 1. So this is the longest wavelength case. And so remember, in this case, the wavelength is equal to twice the length of the string. So you'll notice that at the ends of the string here, we have zero amplitude. And so these are what we call nodes. And this is, in fact, what we'd expect because we constrained the solution to have zero displacement at the two ends of the string. And in the middle here, you can see that between the two ends, everywhere else the amplitude is non-zero. And at this point in the middle where we have a maximum amplitude of vibration, uh, we call this an anti-node. Now, the distance from one node to another node, so the distance from here, for example, to here, so the distance between adjacent nodes is going to be half 
the wavelength of whatever the uh, mode is vibrating at. So the distance between two nodes is half a wavelength, and the distance between a node and an antinode is going to be quarter of a wavelength. Now if we look at the next solution we've got, this is where n is equal to 2, we're going to have a shorter wavelength. Remember here the wavelength is equal to L, and what we've got now is we've got a node in the middle, as well as of course having these nodes at the end. We always have to have a node at the end because we've got these clamped ends, and that's how we constructed our solution. And so we have two antinodes here, one on either side, um, here and here where we have the maximum amplitude vibration and we can also see that when the string goes up here it goes down here so although we have the amplitude vibrations when the string is down in this antinode it's up in this one and then finally we can have a look at the n equals 3 case and now we have yet another node in here and so we have two nodes in the center and of course the nodes at either end and of course we have our antinodes here in the uh, in between the nodes so and in this case our wavelength is equal to 2l over 3. so now we've had a look at what the solutions look like on paper let's actually have a look at a real string vibrating in these modes so here we have a system that will show standing waves. So what we've got is we've got a string and it's essentially going to be clamped at either end because we've got two people holding it, one at each end. And what we're going to do is excite some waves to go down it. They'll reflect off either end and form a standing wave in the center, just as the maths we've been looking at shows. So first, we're going to try for the fundamental frequency where we expect a node at either end and an antinode where we have maximum vibration amplitude right in the center. So that's our fundamental frequency. Now we're going to double the frequency and what you should see is that a node will form in the center but we're also going to have the st uh, string vibrating at a higher frequency. And so you can see in the center there is a zero amplitude point where the string is not vibrating at all and you can see an antinode on either side and at either end there is a node. And now if we increase the frequency a little bit more, uh, since I'm doing this with my hand, we're going to actually reduce the tension uh, which will reduce the frequency so it won't be a factor of three higher than the first two modes we had a look at. But we'll see if we can get it going fast enough to show you the next highest harmonic where we're going to have two nodes in the center. And there we have the next highest harmonic. We're vibrating faster, although I've reduced the tension to help. And you can see two nodes in the center. So now we've seen that the maths works. Our predictions are borne out. When we have a string with a fixed length, we only observe certain wavelengths on that string. And those wavelengths correspond to these standing wave modes. And when we have that, we see that we end up with a node at either end of the string because we've got two closed boundaries, and we have a series of nodes and antinodes spaced evenly along the length of the string. Now, the wavelength for these standing wave modes is constrained by the physical length of the string, right? There are certain mo multiple of the physical length of string. However, the frequency of those modes doesn't just depend on the length of the string, it also depends on the tension of the spring because the frequency is related to the wavelength by the phase velocity of the wave and the standing wave only constrains the wave length. So we're still free to tune the string, if you like, and that is, in fact, how musical instruments work. You don't change the length of a violin string in order to make it play a different note. You change the tension in the violin string in order to make it play a different note, because although the wavelength is the same, by changing the tension, you change the wave speed, and that changes the frequency, and the pitch of the note depends on the frequency of vibration. So what we're seeing here is that, in fact, the physics of standing waves that we've been looking at is, in fact, the physics behind all stringed instruments.